Chapter 3 It did not take long to find out the building was deserted. Very little was left behind. Drew called it in. A forensics team would be down to look at the scene and collect whatever evidence they could. In the meanwhile, Drew looked for any clues of where the gang might have gone. He found nothing. The members and the heroine were in the wind. Gone and unlikely to be found any time soon. He sighed. They should have moved on them. Even having half the crew and twelve pallets of heroin would have been a win. At least they would have more to go on than what they did right now, which was nothing. Eight months of undercover work that might have been fruitless. Drew tried not to think about it. Instead, he collected his bike and started making rounds at some of the local establishments that the criminal element liked to frequent. He went to all sorts of places. Bars, clubs, seedy places. Drew looked and listened. He made a few discreet inquiries, but ended up empty-handed for his work. It was frustrating. Knuckles, Sam, Red, Hendricks, and Law all worked for a man they called the Goals. Goals arranged when shipments of heroin would come in. Drew was certain they were coming off a drop ship. Someone with a small pleasure boat would go out into the ocean, meet a much larger ship, get the barrels of heroin, turn around and bring it back to one of the local marinas, getting past the Coast Guard. It was not an enviable task. If they got caught, it would mean real prison time. However, the Coast Guard could not inspect every boat going through. Not only that, but if a small pleasure craft did not break any laws, they tended to be left alone. It made for an easy setup to distribute the drugs in bulk. Goals would know when a shipment came. He, or someone that he was in contact with, would transport the barrels of heroin to a site. Then Goals' team would secure the barrels, bringing them to an abandoned building, a rented warehouse, sometimes even a storage locker with poor security. Goals' team would weigh and split up the heroin into bricks. The drug was put onto wooden pallets. Sometimes they boxed it. Sometimes they just left it bagged, stacking them like bricks. One of the guys would rent a truck, and another would rent a forklift. The heroin was loaded and sent out to be repackaged and distributed further. At some point, it would end up in some addict's body. Twelve pallets had been a huge load. Usually, they only did one pallet at a time. Drew privately wondered if there was going to be a halt in operations for a while, and goals had stocked up. If that was the case, he might not get a lead on goals for a half year or more. All because one Maxwell Ramsley had stumbled on his undercover mission. It was ridiculous. Giving up, Drew went back to his apartment to dismiss rookie officer Cotter for the night. He found Max sleeping on his sofa, one foot on the floor, the other hanging over the end. He was not going to be very comfortable there, but Drew was not going to trade places. It was still his apartment the last time he checked. Cotter yawned as he headed out the door. The chair in the living area had not been very comfortable for the young man, but he had not dared to sleep in Drew's bed. It was a smart move. There were a couple of tabloids and other papers on the coffee table. Drew had a quick look. Sure enough, the police department's least favorite journalist, Sterling Denver, had penned a front-page story on the tabloid about how Max was missing, presumed to resume to his wild and lavish lifestyle from his youth, thus skipping out on his poor beleaguered wife and two kids. What a bunch of bull. Then again, Sterling was known for not always checking her facts. At least she had managed to get the missing part right. As Drew locked the door, a snore erupted from the couch. Are you kidding me? Drew stared at Max Ramsley, who snored again, loudly. There was a reason Drew lived alone. It was easier. He hated having roommates. He liked his privacy. He liked his space. He liked to have the place to himself. Drew could just stretch it on his salary as a detective, and so he did, even if it meant he was in the same building as his sister and Miguel. He had gotten in years ago before the rents had risen to astronomical. As a result, he had a studio apartment. A small kitchenette was against one wall, a little sitting area for a table, living room area for a couch, chair, coffee table, and television, then the king-size bed against the other wall. There was one shelf and one tall boy. The bathroom was small but efficient. It was all the room one bachelor like himself needed. Drew rarely even had any overnight guests. He preferred to stay over at any of his previous girlfriend's places. It was easier and less complicated. 
Now he had Max Ramsley invading his space and being generally annoying. Another snore punctuated the air. Drew stood at the door and briefly thought about his options. He was not allowed to leave Max alone. If he did and Max decided to contact someone in the outside world, Drew's career would be on the line. No one was going to come and relieve him until morning. Drew could not call someone else to take over and go to a motel. He would never live it down, not babysitting a witness because he snored. Drew rubbed a hand along his tired face. He could not unload the guy on Jana, either. Miguel would have a fit. Earplugs. He had to have earplugs somewhere in this apartment. He would try the old standby of making the guy roll over first. Drew went over to the couch and poked Max. You're snoring. Max rolled over toward the back of the couch and sighed, going straight back to slumberland if he had been awake for even that quick of an interval. Drew walked to the bathroom before another snore rent the air. He glared at the man on the couch and reverted to his original thought. Did he own any earplugs? If not, where could he get a pair at this time of night? Could he ask someone to deliver them? Could a person Uber that sort of thing? Drew looked through the drawers of his bathroom vanity. No earplugs. If they were not in here, Drew did not think that he owned any. Even through the shut door, he could hear Max rattle off another snore. It was going to be a long night. Drew crawled into bed and put a pillow over his head, vowing to get earplugs as soon as possible. Bethany slowly undid her robe and slid it from her shoulders. She folded it neatly, setting it on the chair. The shaking of her hands belied the anxiousness she felt. Remember, cautioned Holly, the two lifeguards are here to help. I'm just going to stand on the side and encourage you. If you feel overwhelmed, you can stop at any time. You are in control of this. Bethany nodded, shivering. She rubbed her arms. She hated the one-piece bathing suit she had picked out for this. It was the first one that she tried on. It was the only bathing suit she currently owned, and she had no desire to own another. Owning a bathing suit generally meant one went swimming, in large quantities of water. Bethany looked at the pool full of water and wished she was anywhere but here with a violence that surprised her. Despite having cleanliness habits that bordered on OCD, she had an aversion for water, which was probably rooted in the nightmare that she had. This side is the shallow end, Holly coaxed her. It's not very deep. The bathtub in her nightmares was not deep. Bethany closed her eyes and pushed away the terror. She was sick of not knowing what had happened why her life was different from so many other people's. Ignoring the cramp of horror in her stomach, she hugged herself with a grip so hard she was hurting her arms where her hands clenched them. Bethany jutted her chin out and marched to the side of the pool where the steps led into the shallow water. Breathing in short, sickly gasps, she submerged one foot on the cement step. She could feel cold sweat coming out on her skin. You can wait until you are comfortable before taking the next step, advised Holly. Bethany closed her eyes and shook her head. She was never going to be comfortable with this. Mostly, she just wanted to get it over with. Going back, retreating, was not an option she was going to give herself. Bethany put her other foot into the water. She did not let herself grab the handrail. If she did, she would cling to it and never go in. Resolutely, she gathered her courage and quickly walked the rest of the steps until the water covered her knees, then her thighs. Bethany stubbed her toe on the bottom of the pool, stumbling, her eyes flying open as she realized there were no more steps. She shook so hard her teeth were clattering. Thank goodness she had not fallen. The female lifeguard was right beside her. The male lifeguard a respectful but close distance should anything happen. She focused on him. I will want him to dunk my head, stuttered Bethany. Bethany, I don't think that's a good idea. You should get used to the water for a while, warned Holly. You do not need to rush this. The psychiatrist did not understand. Bethany squeezed her eyes shut. She was never getting in another pool. If she did not do this now, try to trigger the memories now, she never would. 
Then Bethany would never get the answer she needed to understand what had happened to her. Think about the nightmare. What is similar? What is different? Talk to me, Holly said in her soothing voice. Her feet. Her feet and legs were wet when they should be dry, she thought. Only her head, hands, arms, and shoulders had gotten wet. The edge of the tub had hurt her stomach when he leaned her over it, pushing her head under the water. The water was not clear. There was a white film on it. His hand was not on her face. It was in her hair, pushing her under. The dream was wrong about that. His hand was not on her face. Bethany snapped her eyes open. It was a memory then. I will pay you ten thousand dollars, she looked at the male lifeguard intently. Dunk my head for five seconds, then let it go. Dunk it again for five seconds. He shook his head. Ma'am, I cannot do that. Fifty thousand, Bethany upped the bid. I will do it for that, the female lifeguard said beside her. No, Bethany wanted to shout in frustration. It has to be him. Bethany, I think you should come out of the pool, Holly tried to intervene. We can come back another day after you've calmed down. One hundred thousand, she watched him desperately, taking wobbling steps towards him. That is it. Holly was entering the pool. This session is over. I am sorry, ma'am. The man backed up away from her. I just cannot do that. Bethany knew that she did not have the courage to put her face under the water herself. She began to cry in frustration, feeling like she was never going to find out the answers. Holly put a towel around Bethany's shoulders. Let's get out of the pool. Bethany let herself be let out. She ignored Holly's praises on how far she had come to her goal. She felt like she had accomplished nothing. Disappointment swamped her. Bethany sat on a bench and cried bitterly over the experience. Drew was starting to feel annoyed. It had been two days since the operation had gone south, both literally and figuratively. He had not been contacted about any further arrangements by the criminals peddling the heroin, nor had he learned any valuable information from his sources on the streets. It also did not help that people kept stopping him in the street and asking if he was Max Ramsley. Some people snapped photos of him with their phones. A few called it into the police trying to get the reward. It was getting to the point where Drew was getting some guff from the guys at the police department. Every time he went through the doors, they told him how many Drew sightings they had each day. It was ridiculous. What was worse, he had gotten a message on his voicemail from Sterling Denver, the tabloid journalist. She wanted to meet with him and discuss why he looked so much like Max Ramsley. That was never going to happen. How she had been able to track him down bothered Drew. If she could figure it out, then other people could. However, the possibility did not bother him as much as still having Max Ramsley living in his tiny apartment while the wet-behind-the-ears rookie Cotter pretended to look after him. Basically, they both watched cable and bonded while eating Drew's food. Drew looked at his empty fridge. Hey, rich boy, pony up some cash for groceries? I have a twenty, Max said as he pulled out his wallet. After that, it's credit or we'll have to hit the bank. Dude... Cotter shook his head. You're missing, remember? You can't go to the bank. Neither can we use your cards. Someone at the bank is bound to report it. Max frowned. I hadn't thought of that. Drew snatched the twenty before Max could think of taking it back. At the very least, he could get a few groceries on his way back tonight. In the meanwhile, he might have to borrow from Janet to keep the two guys on his couch from starving. He wondered if Miguel had told her or if he was being cowardly and waiting for Drew to do it. Probably waiting, Drew decided, since he had not heard anything from Jana. There she is. Max grinned and pointed to the television. That is my beautiful wife. It was on a national news channel. Drew inwardly groaned. It was one thing to be local, but to go national? What were they going to say when they magically found Max Ramsley? He decided it was not his problem. Green would have to take care of it. Mrs. Paget Ramsley tearfully pled for any news of her missing husband with quiet dignity. She was very pretty, 
and Drew could see how she might have caught Max's attention. Drew had a look at his half-brother and realized the man was absolutely besotted with his wife. Drew inwardly shrugged. People were weird like that sometimes. Did you see the latest? Cotter held up a tabloid to Drew. He took it. Max Ramsley feared dead. Wife celebrates. Max grinned confidently. They are so wrong this time. Drew was not so sure. She was probably getting the best sleep of her life for the past few days. They had better get things resolved soon, or she might never take Max back. The article went on to say how Mrs. Ramsley was about to become a wealthy woman with her husband's shares from Ramsley Pharmaceutical once she was found to be a widow. Drew shook his head in disbelief and tossed the paper back onto the coffee table. Tabloid journalist Sterling Denver was losing her touch if this was anything to go by. There was a sound of a key in the lock and the door to the apartment opening. Drew immediately turned, and Cotter raised his weapon as the man with the tattoos on his neck and arm entered the room. He stopped and looked at them in surprise. Yo, you gonna shoot me or something? He asked, looking at Cotter. Cotter, put your gun away. Drew directed and sighed. Just what he needed. What do you want, Molson? Molson shut the door after himself. Not to get shot would be a good start. He put his gun away already, so stop your whining. Drew folded his arms. Since when do you have a key? Since you moved here and lent me yours so I could bring stuff in? Molson moved to the kitchen, looking through the cupboards and fridge. I made a copy at the local hardware store before I gave it back. Don't you have any food here? They keep eating it. Drew had a sneaking suspicion that Molson had been helping himself to Drew's kitchen throughout the years now that he knew the guy had a key. It would explain the times when Drew had run out of groceries sooner than he thought he should. Why don't you bum food off of Jana? What? And get the why don't you do something useful with your life for a change lecture again? Followed closely by the you are setting a bad example for my kids routine? Molson shook his head, grabbed a bowl and poured some cereal into it. No thank you. There is no milk, Drew remarked mildly. Jana did tend to lecture Molson a lot. It was part of why Drew refused to. I know it. Molson ran the bowl under the faucet. Just like how Ma used to make it. Drew shuddered. He remembered soggy, gross cereal in the mornings when they did not have milk as a kid. It happened more often than not. That is just wrong. Max spoke up from the couch. Can you even eat cereal like that? No, Drew responded with a disgusted face as Molson took a huge spoonful and crunched it. Molson shrugged and kept eating. He pointed the spoon at Max. There's a reward for him. Do not even think about it, growled Drew. Cops starting a ransom thing? Molson plopped himself into the armchair and slouched, munching away. Pay too low? That one looks a little green to be holding a gun. Cotter frowned at the insult Molson gave him. I've been with the force for five years now. Huh. Molson nodded, self-satisfied with Cutter's response. Rookie on the NARC team. Who are you? Max asked in fascination. Oh, nobody introduced me? Molson pretended to look offended. Really, bro? I thought you'd have told Mr. Ramsley, third of the legitimate Ramsley children, who we all were. Drew sighed. He was getting a headache. Molson did that to him. Molson Colburn, meet Max Ramsley. Max, meet Molson. We think David Ramsley might be his father as well. He's my little brother, so I guess that makes him yours, too. Max studied Molson with interest. I am. Molson crunched his cereal. I had a paternity test done. I'm from the old man. However, interesting enough, Jana ain't. What? Drew frowned at this revelation. How do you know this? Remember when Jenny was going through that scare with leukemia? They thought she might need a donor, said Molson. Jenny is Jana and Miguel's first daughter. She was okay, remembered Drew. It's not in leukemia at all. At the time, I thought I'd be a little proactive and see if Pops really was related to us all. Molson shrugged as he scooped another spoonful of cereal. Turns out, he's not Jana's dad. Are you going to tell her? questioned Drew. Why? 
What difference does it make? asked Molson. Not like Mom's going to remember who Jana's real dad might be. What are those tattoos on your neck? Do they mean something? Max was getting more intrigued by this family the more he learned. Those are gang tattoos, Cotter said shortly. He was not pleased with Molson. Although how he belongs to two rival gangs at the same time, that is surprising. Molson had a cocky grin. I'm talented. If you bothered to study them some, you'd see there are five gang tattoos on my neck. Most of them gangs do not like each other none. Then how do you belong to them all at once? wondered Cotter, generally puzzled. Through this. Molson pointed the tattooed tear on his face, then the crosses on his forearm, and finally to the sixth tattoo on his neck. Are you a gang member, then? Max asked, his curiosity aroused. Your brother and sister are cops, yet you joined the gangs Drew was trying to put in jail? Doesn't that seem a little, I don't know, counterproductive? Irritating, annoying, disturbing, Drew said sharply. I can think of a few other words to describe it. Molson, do me a favor. Tell me you are not going to let any of your gang buddies know that Max is here, safe and sound in my apartment. His location needs to be kept secret. I'm hurt. Molson placed a hand over his heart in a long-suffering manner. My own flesh and blood don't trust me. You're right. I don't trust you, Drew scowled. Now see, that really did hurt. Molson looked at Drew, dropping the act. He grabbed his empty bowl and stood up. Don't you worry none. I'll do you a solid and forgot I ever saw him here. Molson clapped Drew on the shoulder as he passed him into the kitchen area, putting his bowl in the sink. Molson, I'm sorry, sighed Drew. He hated fighting with his younger brother, but that was all they ever seemed to do. He knew that despite his brother's words, he had probably hurt Molson's feelings. Molson was just a master at covering up how he really felt on most occasions. Then again, when you lived with Wacko Margo, you had to figure out a way to hide your feelings. When you gonna go see Ma? Molson changed the subject as he walked to the door of the apartment. Never, if I can help it, Drew muttered. He had no desire to see her any time soon. I know she's a crappy person, Molson paused at the door, and she did give birth to you, you know? Drew decided not to answer. It was probably better for all concerned if he did not share his opinion of Margaret Colburn. Yeah, and you guys say I'm the disappointment. Molson shrugged and left the apartment, pulling the door firmly behind him. He is interesting, Max said from the couch. What does the tear under his eye mean? That he killed someone, replied Cotter. Really? Max stared at the young cop, surprised at the answer. Not necessarily, Drew defended his brother. It can also mean a loss. Not every tattoo means the same thing to the same people. It's a gang tattoo. Like the crosses mean closer to the god or time spent in prison, stated Cotter flatly. Molson has never been in prison. He's never been arrested. Drew checked regularly to be sure. He did not like his brother's choices and worried about him. It was one of Drew's outstanding worries that Molson would someday be dead on the streets or in prison because of his ties to gangs. What was the other tattoo? questioned Max, the one on his neck with the five gang tattoos. That one I don't know, Cotter looked at Drew. No one knows. Drew sighed. Molson had never told him what it meant. Molson's the only one I have ever seen with that tattoo. It means something surrounded by the five gang membership tattoos. Does he really belong to five gangs? Is that even possible? Max wanted to know. This was a possible half-brother to his family, a man with ties to gangs. With Molson, anything is possible, Drew said darkly. Are you going on the sting operation today? wondered Cotter. Drew nodded. He knew the rookie was disappointed not to be able to participate, but someone needed to watch Max. Drew was only going to be there as a lookout for the team at the marina as they scoped out a possible drug drop. Is this related to those guys from the building? asked Max. Maybe. We don't know yet. Max asked far too many questions in Drew's opinion. Drew was not inclined to give him answers since he was only a civilian and this was an ongoing investigation. I am going to get some food. Drew made his escape while he could. Three floors down, he knocked on Jana's door. Miguel answered. You haven't told her? Drew asked quietly. I advise you should, 
Miguel answered just as quietly. I can hear you whispering by the door. Jana called from the kitchen. Now come inside and let me know what it is about. Drew sighed again. Morning, Jana. How is the grocery situation? What? You don't know where the store is? Jana raised an eyebrow as she packed lunches for school. I have a couple of unwanted guests that I need to feed. I will replace whatever you give me. Drew poured himself some coffee and dropped into a chair. If they're unwanted, then maybe you should not feed them. Maybe they will go away, Jana said tartly as she put the lunches into school bags. I wish, Drew scowled. Hi, Uncle Drew, Jenny smiled at him. Did you see my picture? Drew leaned over to look at the little girl's artwork. That is a neat picture. Lots of color. Thank you, she grinned happily. Okay, kiddos, time for school. Miguel grabbed the backpacks and ushered the two girls out the door. He was making a strategic retreat. Drew envied him for it. Jana grabbed a coffee and sat down. Who are your visitors? A rookie cop who is on duty when I'm not home to guard a witness. We're pretending that he is missing so that my cover remains intact. Drew shrugged. Not that it's making any difference, since I have not been able to remain in contact with my assignment for the last couple of days. It is unusual to have a witness at a cop's place of residence, Jana remarked. Her voice and eyes said that he had better explain. Drew rolled his eyes. Green was in an odd sort of mood. I guess it tickled his funny bone to give the guy to me since he crashed my operation. Who was the guy? Jana sipped her coffee. Everyone knew Green had not been in the best frame of mind since he started his latest kick of trying to quit smoking. Max Ramsley, Drew reluctantly informed her. The Max Ramsley? Jana put down her mug. Dad's youngest kid from his wife? Drew blinked in surprise. You know. You think that I wouldn't check on Dad's other family just to see? Jana gave him a surprised look. Of course I know. I am a cop. I investigate people. Did Max know that he has half-siblings? Not a clue, shrugged Drew. Thinks this is great. I expect we'll all get invited to holidays if Max has any say in the matter. Jana laughed. I don't think his parents would like that. For what little I have gathered, I don't think he's on speaking terms with Dad right now. Drew drained his coffee. Have you seen Mom lately? No, and I have no intention of seeing her, scowled Jana. Why? Molson came around this morning. Drew frowned. He asked if I intended to visit her any time soon. If he chooses to keep in contact with Margot, that is his problem, Jana said firmly. I've been thinking. I'm not so sure I want Molson around the kids any more. Drew looked at her sharply. As much as he did not like all the things Molson was involved in, he would not cut his brother out of his life. He is their uncle. I know. Believe me, I've thought about this a lot, and I'm not happy. It's not been an easy decision. Jana sighed and took a fortifying sip of coffee. He has gang connections. He's disrespectful on occasion. I do not want my kids influenced by him. The other day, Kara was asking about his tattoo, and he's explaining it all to her like she's an adult. She is five. I do not want any of my children thinking that it's okay to be in a gang or date a gangbanger just because their uncle is a member. You are just going to cut him off? Drew could not imagine it. He wondered how Molson would take it. Probably not well. You know if you do that, he'll likely never talk to you or Miguel again. I need to protect my kids. Jana looked at Drew steadily. What if Molson makes the wrong person angry? We all know there is gang fallout on family members at times. Drew did not like it. He understood her point, but he did not like it. He is our brother. Molson needs to get out of the gangs before he ends up in prison or dead, Jana said firmly. Maybe if I cut him off, he'll finally realize that what he's doing is wrong. Or he will be as stubborn as he always is and dig in further, Drew responded. Privately, he thought that Jana's lecturing Molson throughout the years had not helped the situation. A lot of times, if you told Molson not to do something, he did exactly what you did not want him to do. Then it is even more important that my kids have nothing to do with him. Jana got up and began to put breakfast away. Give me a list and I'll go grocery shopping for you. I will even deliver to your apartment since it is time I get to meet one of the real Ramsleys. 
Drew sighed and opened his wallet. He forked over some cash. We need everything. I'll drop by a bank today and get you the rest later. He got up and put his mug in the sink. Jana, I know that you do not want advice from me, but hold off on pushing Molson away. Do not do something you might regret. How can I regret protecting my kids? Jana asked him. By burning your relationship with your baby brother, said Drew grimly. Just wait a little while, okay? Think it through. I have been thinking it through. I have a son who is going to look up to his father, but we all know sons can rebel. Jana folded her arms. The last thing I want is my boy to get angry at his father or I and decide to join his Uncle Molson. If Molson will drop the gangs, then he can stay in our lives. If he won't... Drew was not going to be able to convince her to change her mind. What does Miguel have to say? He agrees with me, Jana stated firmly. I think you are making a mistake, Drew said gently. I think you're going to ruin your relationship with Molson. It's up to him to decide what he wants. If those gangs are more important to him than his family, then his priorities are mixed up. Jana frowned. Speaking of almost family, Drew grimaced slightly as he waded into the delicate subject. Be nice to Max. He's a bit naive, but he means well. When am I not nice? she said innocently. Drew decided not to answer that particular trap and made his escape. I need to get to work. Jana waved him away. Thank you for listening to Chapter 3 of Love and Lies, Book 5 of the Ramsey Brothers series. Look for Chapter 4. Just a reminder, hit the subscribe button so that you can find all of my videos, including upcoming Ramsley Brothers series audiobooks. This is free for you, and it helps my algorithms with the YouTube channel. Thank you, and happy listening!